Hi and welcome to this chapter on the default VPC. So the default VPC gets created when an account is created. It has a CADR block of 172.31.0.0/16. There is a default subnet that is located within the VPC. You can start launching instance right away in this default VPC. It has an internet gateway. So if your instance has a public or an elastic IP address, it you can access this EC2 instance via the internet. It has pre-built NACLs, security groups, and DHCP options. Now, obviously, we will go into further detail on how you can create subnets, how you can create a VPC, launching instances, attaching gateways, and the different security options available for a VPC. But it's good to know that if you're just starting off as an AWS developer and just create an account, it's good to have your own default VPC already set up by AWS so you can start experimenting right away. So let's now go on to the console. Let's just see what the default VPC looks like. So here I am in the AWS console. If I go down to networking and content delivery, I can see the option of a VPC. So this is our newly created account. So when we look at our dashboard, you will actually get a list of all the artifacts as present in this VPC. You can see that we have one VPC. We have something known as a route table. So the route table actually helps in making sure that the packets are delivered between the VPC and subnets. You have a security group. You have an internet gateway. So I said the VPC comes with an internet gateway. We have three subnets which come along with the default VPC. And we have one network ACL which comes as part of the default VPC. So let's click on the VPC option. We can see the VPC has the CIDR block as mentioned in the slides. If you click on the VPC, you will see the details of the VPC itself. Some important things to note about the VPC are, first is the DNS resolution and DNS host names. So when, it, when this is enabled to yes, it means that all the EC2 instances launched in your VPC will automatically get a DNS host name given by AWS. Now, when we launch an EC2 instance, we will actually see the DNS name attached to the EC2 instance. Now, the different artifacts have IDs. So, for example, the route table has an ID. If you click on the route table, you will actually go to the screen where the route table has been defined. Now, for now, you don't need to worry about the route table and the subnets. We will go through this in another chapter. I just want to show you that you can go from one section to the other very easily in AWS via the links in the properties of a particular artifact. So let me go back to my default VPC. Now on the left hand side, I can see various options that are included in the VPC dashboard. So the first thing is obviously all my VPCs. Next is the subnets. So I said that you can have subnets in your VPC to host your EC2 instances. In the default VPC, you have three subnets defined. If you click on the subnet, one important thing to note I said is the availability zone. So each region has an availability zone which has a particular name. So this subnet is associated with the AZ US West 2C. Now if you click on the second subnet, you can see that's a link to another availability zone. So I said regions have multiple availability zones defined in them. And each subnet can correspond to only one AZ. You can see what is a CIDR block of the subnet. You can see the number of available IPs in the subnet itself. One important point to note in the subnet is the auto assign public IP. So when this is enabled to yes, automatically each EC2 instance in your subnet will be assigned a public IP. And if your VPC is connected to the outside world, so for example, you have an internet gateway that is connected to the internet, then you can reach this EC2 instance from the internet via this public IP. Now there are instances where you want your subnet not to have this enabled. 
Why? If you're hosting database servers in a subnet, you would want to keep it private. You don't want to expose your database subnet to the outside world. In such a case, you would want the auto-assigned public IP to be no. In every artifact that's available in the dashboard, you have a subset of actions. So for example, in the subnets, you can actually modify the auto-assign IP range. And if you want to disable it, it's as simple as unchecking this and clicking on save. I'm not going to do it right now. So I said these are options. If I go to the VPC, so if I click on the desired VPC and I go to actions, I have option to delete the VPC, we edit the DHCP option, the DNS name resolution and etc. So each artifact in the left hand side will have an associate list of actions that you can perform on the artifact. If you go on to internet gateways, we can see there is one internet gateway and this is attached to the VPC ID. If you click on the VPC ID, you will actually come to our default VPC. Now it's normally good to have tags assigned to your resources in AWS. Now for example, it is difficult to identify whether this is the default VPC or not. Now obviously you have the CIDR range, so you know this is the default VPC. But if you have a multiple range of VPCs, it's difficult to understand what the VPC is meant for. This is where you can actually have tags. So over here you have something known as a name tag. You can actually have a particular value for this name and you can put any value that you want. So let me put this as the default VPC. So now I know that this VPC is indeed my default VPC by way of a tag. If I go on to the tag section, you can even add more tags over here or edit the existing tags. So you're just basically putting metadata for your information and make it more easier for you to identify which resources do what in AWS. So we've seen the Internet Gateway, the VPC and the subnets. So this marks the end of the chapter on default VPCs. Let's move on to the next chapter.